Thank you very much for the introduction. So hi everyone, I'm Lisa. I'm happy to be here today to talk about pseudorandom um, correlation generators and why they're useful. This is joint work um, with the lead ball, Jufra Couteau, Niv Geboa, Yuval Ishai, and Peter Scholl. So the setting we're in is secure two-party computation, where Alice and Bob want to securely evaluate a function on their inputs without leaking anything more um, than the function output. And this is great, we know how to do this for a long time, but the problem is always efficiency. So one, um, one way to deal with this is to push the expensive cryptographic part to an offline computation phase, which can be um, done long before the inputs are known. And then one, once the inputs are known, the endline phase is very efficient and um, has lots of nice properties. But the problem is, like, or now we kind of shifted the expensive part to the pre-processing phase. So in particular, even though the parties can um, gener like generate this correlated randomness that they need long ahead, they have to store it for a long time and it requires lots of communication. So what we do in this talk is, um, uh, or what we did, in, uh, what we did in, this, uh, in this work, is how to significantly reduce the cost for communication and storage. And um, the correlation I want to focus on today is oblivious transfer. Transfer, we've already seen it in all the talks before today uh, briefly. So um, just to briefly recall, um, Alice and Bob uh, execute a protocol such that Alice learns exactly one messages of Bob, and Bob doesn't learn anything about which of the two um, she learned. And the correlated random strings will look then something like, like the blue parts that you see here, where um, you have the input and the output of Alice and Bob. And those strings have to be long, typically, to compute circuits. Because well, Why is that, for example, if you consider the GMW protocol, um, you cry two OTs per end gate. So for like a huge circuit, you will need a huge number of those correlated OTs. And so the problem, so this is theoretical, if you have OT, we can do this, but this is very expensive. It's computationally expensive because OT is, uh, is, lives in the public key vault, so it's expensive. And this is already, this already has a solution. So the solution towards this is, as we've already also seen in the first talk today, is a hybrid approach, where you use a few base OTs and then the rest you do with cheap symmetric key cryptography. And this is super nice. This solves the problem from like a computational viewpoint. But still, what I said before, we still have the problem that the communication and the storage required is linear in the number of OTs we want to, we want to generate. And of course, this is inherent if we care about chosen OT, where actually Alice and Bob um, um, chose their messages. But for, for the setting we're in for secure computation, we actually, we actually, we actually find we just need this to be random. And as you, like for example, if you, if you think about computation, uh, communication, for communication, if you just care about random messages, you don't need communication linear in the number of messages. You can just exchange um, a short seed for, for PRG and then you can locally extend. And this is exactly what we did in this work. We got rid of this part of the communication. So um, this is what we call silent OT extension, where the extension is local, so, um, which will make the communication and the storage sublinear in the number of OTs to be generated. And how, how do we do this? What's the tool to achieve this? So this is um, so-called pseudo-random correlation generators, where um, Alice and Bob have short correlated seeds that are correlated in some way, and then they can locally expand them to get long correlated pseudorandom strings. And how does this help us for what we want to achieve? Well, um, if you think about it, because the seeds are only short, a few OTs are sufficient. We only need a few OTs to exchange the seeds, and then the parties can locally expand them, so without any um, communication. And then if, we, if the correlation we have a P, PCG for is the OT correlation, then what the long strings will be will be many, many OTs that then can be used in, by the online phase, that then can be used for efficient online computation. And what I want to stress in particular is that a PCG have this silent feature. 
So the, the only thing communication is necessary for is the short seeds. So in particular, um, the storage and the communication now only, um, only depends on the seed size and not on, not on the, um, and there's no, for expansion, there's no more communication necessary. So you can even, for, um, for a multi-party, um, for, for protocols, you can, even, you can even do this with many parties, even if you're not sure if you, are, if you will engage in a, in a secure computation in the future, because all you have to do is to store this very short seed. And there has been some construction of PCGs around for very simple correlations like multilinear um, correlations from one-way functions already um, since 20 years ago. And there has been also for more complex um, correlation, there were constructions, but, um, but, 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 not, but not really practical. And the first one that was like a complex correlation and practical was, uh, was from, from last year, a vector oblivious linear function evaluation uh, from the learning parity with noise assumption. And um, yeah, and this work actually builds on, builds, on, builds on this work. So what we did in this work um, was we defined um, pseudo-random correlation generators. So um, we, we formally define it for general correlations. Um, we gave connections to homomorphic secret sharing, um, two-way co connections, um, and we concre constructed like concrete constructions um, for oblivious transfer from the learning parity with noise assumption, or more generally, um, constant degree correlations. Um, we gave uh, construction for one-time truth tables just based on one-way functions and uh, for low-degree correlations in the two-party and the multi-party setting from either the multivariate quadratic assumption or, again, the LPN assumption together with um, learning with errors over rings or the symmetric external Diffie-Hillman assumption. And in the talk today, I want to focus on giving the definition of um, PCG for general correlations and on um, oblivious transfer from the learning parity with noise assumption. Okay, so, yes, so um, how, 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 how can you define um, pseudorandom correlation generators? So um, you have um, uh, two algorithms. You have a um, key generation algorithm that, that generates short correlated seeds. And then you have an expansion algorithm that you can use to that you can use to expand, like locally expand those seeds to long correlated strings. And of course, we want correctness, so we want this um, two strings to be correlated in whatever, like for example, satisfy the OT correlation that we care about in this setting. And we want security. And how we define security. Um, is that we want, an, basically how we define security is, is to say that either party can, can learn nothing more from, from, from their own seed that they can trivially derive from knowing that, that the long, that their own long string will be in correlation with the other party's string. And this is not the most natural definition that you can think of because we said we want to use this um, as, a, as, a, as a replacement in, in, in protocols for secure computation. So a more natural definition would be a simulation-based um, definition to say like for every uh, protocol you can, you can plug this in. But unfortunately, this is impossible um, to achieve. We show this even, even for deterministic functionalities. But um, we also show that the definition we give, the indistinguishable-based the definition, is good enough for like a, a lot of protocols um, that satisfies slightly stronger um, um, security requirement. This is the case, for example, the GMW protocol that I mentioned, also the speech protocol. So in many, you can actually just directly plug out this, this, um, this in. And yes, so we talked about the definition. Um, um, now, um, um, the, now, now I want to give you a construction. How can you actually instantiate this for the correlation of, um, of oblivious transfer? So what we actually will give is not a PCG directly for oblivious transfer, but a PCG for um, correlated or to oblivious transfer, which is exactly the same like oblivious transfer, but instead of having two um, to um, unrelated messages, Bob will, the, the messages of Bob will be always the, the first message, the second message will be always the first message, plus some um, constant offset. 
And yeah, then you can rewrite Alice messages as, as being, as being uh, the first message plus either this offset or not. And as Ishai, Kilian, Nisim, and Petrang showed, if you have correlated OT and you have a correlation robust hash function, this actually gives you OT. So the idea is basically just you can hash and then this breaks the correlation and then you have just the normal OT that you want. And so if you look at this and if you rephrase that, like a, another way to saying what correlated OT is, is saying, so now like, putting many together, so having like a random vector, we can say, so, so Alice and Bob get a secret sharing of this choice bit of Alice times this offset delta. So this is another way. So what we have to generate is actually this kind of secret sharing, additive secret sharing. So in, in order to, to, to get, a, get a BCG for that, we ne need a compression of the vector. So we need a compression of, um, Q and B for Alice, and we need a compression of the vector R for Bob, such that Q plus R is this delta times B. And we will show how to do this in three steps. So the first step is we, we use um, so-called distributed point functions to get a PCG whenever B is a unit vector. Then the next step is actually, um, the next step is, um, is just um, we show that you can locally, like it's, it's super straightforward to go from a unit vector to a sparse vector. And then the interesting part is once we have a sparse vector, how can we get to a pseudo random vector? And so as I said, um, the, main, like the main tool for the, for the first part are distributed point function. So what is a point function? A point function is a function that is zero everywhere exactly except um, at, uh, at one single point where, where it will be some, some, some value y. And the distributed point function is just distributing the function between two parties such that, that the parties um, alone don't learn about what the value alpha is and what the value y is, but together they can recover. So they can locally evaluate every input x on the keys to, to evaluate the output of the function. And if you like write this graphically, then, then, then if Alice has this key k0 and, and Bob has this key k1, they can expand it. And by expansion here, I mean evaluating the point function on every point of the input. So here we assume a polynomial input space so that you can actually do this. So you evaluate on every point on the input. And then if you add it up, you get, a, you get the unit vector times, times the y at exactly the position alpha. And why, why are distributed point functions a good, a, a good starting point? Um, for two reasons. First, there's if, uh, if there exist efficient constructions from one-way functions. And second, um, by Derner and Shellat, um, it's, it's possible to efficiently um, do a distributed setup, which will be necessary to set up the seed that we actually need to expand. And um, once we have distributed point function, then the PCG for unit vector, you can, it's, 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 it's very straightforward. So all you give the parties is the keys for the distributed point function. Alice additionally gets this point alpha, so she knows where, where, where it's punctured. And she gets the value delta blinded by the, by the point of the distributed um, point function. And this will be good for her to replace the output value of the distributed point function by delta. Um, so what the parties will do, so this is the, this is the, the, this is the seed, and then the expansion is simply evaluating the distributed point function at every point. Alice will add at the green part, at the alpha part, she will add this y plus delta. And then because of the properties of the distributed point function, we will have that if you add up q and r, this will be delta times the unit vector. And so, so b is this unit vector that is, that is alpha at this point. So we have a PCG, we can expand, we have a PCG if B is the unit vector. But of course we want more, like we want B not to be the unit vector, we want B to be a random vector in the all. So how can we go from a, how can we go from a, a unit vector to a to, to random vector? Well, first a sparse vector. Um, if you take a look at the correlation, again, this is a, this is a linear, this is, this is a linear term, everything is linear. So all, li all terms, so we have a secret sharing, all linear operations can just be performed in the shares. So the addition, if we want, to, we can just repeat the exact same procedure t times, and then add it all up, Alice adds her output up, Bob adds their, her, his output up, and then we get, we get the same for a sparse vector. 
And then the interesting part is to go from the sparse vector to the pseudo-random vector. And for this, we use um, the learning parity with noise assumption, um, which basically states that if you have like an over-determined set of, 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 of linear equations, or you have this matrix product with a small secret vector, and then you add the sparse noise, so the noise is zero except for a few points, then this will look, this will look random. And what we actually need is the dual version of this, where you multiply the, the, the left kernel of this pink matrix, um, and then you will see here in this equation what it will do. It will take a, a, a random sparse vector, and it will shrink it a bit, but then you, get something, you will, will get something pseudo-random. Pseudo and this is exactly what we, what we want. And why, why, why this is so useful for our, um, for our construction, because again, matrix multiplication is something linear, so the parties can perform this linearly. There's no, no, no communication required. And the main challenge um, you have here is now in terms of, of computation, because this, because this matrix is big, it will be linear in the number of OTs, and often, if we're interested in, in generating 10 million OTs, then this will, this will be a big matrix. So what we do is we use quasi-cyclic codes, where the multiplication basically becomes a polynomial multiplication, so quasi-linear in the, in the number of OTs. And the security that we get is similar to post-quantum crypto systems like Bike, uh, Bike or HQC. And um, something, um, something like I also want to mention, so LPN is, is, is some kind of symmetric style assumption for two reasons. So first of all, it does not um, imply public key encryption for certain noise rates. Also, noise rates were for our, like, which you can use for our construction. And second of all, it's, it's very efficient. So, so again, we, we get an OT extension where it, like, we only use symmetric style cryptography. And now just um, putting everything together. Um, the last step is, is to multiply, so take this, this matrix and again, just locally apply it to, 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 to the, the results we have from the previous operation, and then, and then we get the Q and the B and the R. This will be actually the output of, the, of our um, PCG. And by, because we have correctness of the distributed point function, and uh, addition is linear, and, and the matrix multiplication is linear, this will actually give us what we want. And even though this might look I mean, a bit small now on the slides, what we get in the end. I mean, this is a, is a, is a big compression. Like, we, we have a bit of shrinkage by the LPN matrix, but, um, but uh, so instead of having, if the output here is N, the, the, the keys, um, um, what we need to exchange, so the keys are only, are only lambda, mal, <laughs> lambda times log N, so we have, we have, a, we have a big uh, achievement here. And uh, yeah, to come to a comparison to, to previous OT extension protocols, I said in the beginning that uh, what we have, I forgot that if you do it with addition, you actually also have to factor T because you have to do it T times, but yeah. Um, if you compare it with previous OT extension protocols, I said it's linear in the number of OTs, but it's actually even worse. If you look at the concrete numbers, um, the communication, um, is like for a single OT, even a bit OT, you, you get something like 70, at least 70, 78 bits per, per OT. And we bring this down with this approach to, to zero to three bits per, um, random, um, per random OT, so, so significantly less. And um, like maybe on the downside of having a logarithmic in, in the number of n, in the number of output lengths, number of rounds, and we don't have active security. But actually, both of this um, we solve in a, in a follow-up work with, together with Peter Rindahl, where we get it down to two rounds. So actually, the first efficient two-round OT extension. Um, we back up the communication with, a, with an implementation. So there we get 0 0.1 um, communication per random OT for generating 10 million uh, OTs. And we also get an, uh, get an active, uh, get active security. And what does it mean for the GMW protocol that we had at the beginning? So um, if you use the GMW protocol with, uh, for example, the IKMP, you get more than 100 bits um, per end gate, so with all previous approaches. And we bring it down to four. So four is actually the, the cost of the online phase. So we make um, pre-processing almost for free in terms of communication. Um, and um, 
On the other hand, so talking about computation, so our approach needs, we can generate uh, about a million OTs per second. Um, so this is uh, slower than IKNP, but over slow networks, because we have huge, uh, this um, huge uh, saving in terms of communication, we, we, we outperform IKNP. And uh, so con to conclude this talk, um, pseudorandom correlation generators are useful. So they give um, multi secure multi-party computation with silent uh, preprocessing. Um, we have a silent OT extension from the learning parity with noise assumption, which is concretely efficient. Um, the idea is you take few base OTs and then you locally expand, and the only thing you need is symmetric, symmetric style crypto. And um, we, um, we also achieve, like we improved this, to actually get the two-round OT extension and also malicious security with, uh, with the same techniques, um, but, but getting a better, better setup phase, basically. Um, and from what is also interesting to mention, it, what this line of work gives, it gives new feasibility results and, and practical instantiations from learning parity with noise. And, and this is interesting because, um, um, because, uh, because um, if, 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 in particular for the practical instantiation, we're not, we don't know how to do this from, 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 strong, from seemingly stronger assumption, like, like learning with arrows. So this is, actually gives something new. And uh, yeah, as this is, uh, there's lots of uh, things to do. There's lots of operant problems to work on. So, and we have, we, in our paper, we give construction uh, for beaver triples for oblivious linear function evaluation, um, but they're not as efficient as the OT construction that I showed you. So like, can we, can we use similar techniques? Can we do things to get, to get it actually as efficient as the OT construction? Um, what would be super cool to achieve is, um, a PCG where we don't have to expand it all at once, but only expand it like um, however much, much we need um, to extend. And because uh, like a big part or like a very central part to our construction is learning parity with noise. So, so, so further, further um, study the learning parity with noise assumption, which code noise combinations are, are, are friendly, are LPN, LPN friendly. Um, what is, what is the best way of implementing learning parity with noise in large scale? Because generally, like, people look more into when you have, when you have a smaller, smaller, smaller matrix. But we really interested, we want to have like, as big as possible because then we can get um, more OTs. Um, what is the best way to do so computationally efficiently? And more from the theoretical side, um, giving a, um, a generic LPN model because our construction um, it's of course not a black box construction, but it has some black box flavor and maybe giving a model where we can capture the black box um, flavor of our construction. So yeah, that's um, it for me. So thank you very much for the attention. And Any questions? Thanks for the talk. Uh, so I was wondering um, if you apply this protocol to the GMW, um, you get very small communication in the pre-processing. Can you comment on the local computation cost for the parties? So the, as I said, so the local computation cost, you have, um, you, have a, you have a million OTs per second. So we studied, so for, the, so for, um, so for a T extension, like if you just consider the if you just consider the OT extension part, um, uh, for in, in our follow work, up work if if you do this over like over over wide area network with uh, ten me megabit megabit per second, uh, you get um, almost uh, fifty times improvement. So even if you if you factor in the the, the, the computation, you, you can get improvements over like replacing I I can P. Uh, can I ask a second? So um, you mentioned that for the LPN, you used um, quasi-cyclic code for the improvement. So I was wondering, like, uh, uh, why does it not add another coding theory, like um, code-based cryptography assumption? Sorry? But, so this, your protocol security still reduces to LPN itself with, with no additional code-based cryptography assumption? I mean, we have to, to, to assume, like, like, like for the, that it's secure for u using this kind, for using... Uh, this kind of code. So as I said, it's, it's similar mm. to the assumption that, that um, post-quantum like, um, post cryptosystem.
So it is, is it uh, equivalent to playing LPN or is it not? Uh, it's, uh, it's, not, it's not, so for, for random matrices, so that's not uh, equivalent that okay. we know of. Okay. Thank yeah. you. Uh, yeah, let's uh, thank the speaker again and we will. <laughs>